Dr. Abagi Sakadapulio, welcome to Shrink Wrap Radio. Thank you for having me. Well, and thank you so much for your tolerance of my pronunciation of your name. <laughs> a little bit challenging for me. Um, yeah, and I'm so glad to have you on the show. Uh, we're going to be discussing work that's around your forthcoming book. I think it's not quite out yet, if I understand that. And the title of your book is Sexuality Beyond Consent, and the subtitle is Risk, Race, Traumatophilia, eroticism slash sadism. So we'll be getting into those topics uh, as we get a little further along, but um, maybe you can tell us something about your background, where you're from, uh, and maybe in, any of the things that might have some bearing on on uh, how we read your book. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for asking that question because context is so important. So, um, yeah start by saying so i um i am half greek and half cypriot so i grew up um bicultural um grew up in i I missed i missed that for you are what say it again i'm half greek half cypriot so half half greek half cypriot cyprus is a small island cypriot okay Mm -hmm. It's a Great. small island. It's a sovereign nation um, um, in uh, the Mediterranean. It's right across from Lebanon. Um, okay. I grew up in a bicultural family uh, between these two locations um, and came to the States really determined to be a psychoanalyst um, in my mid-20s. Um, did my graduate training here in New York, um, got my PhD, and then uh, proceeded to become a psychoanalyst. And I'm now working full time, seeing patients clinically, and also teaching and writing and um, being in conversation with interesting people like yourself. Oh, great. (laughs) I'm glad I qualify. Yeah, actually, you your your book is based on interesting conversations and interesting reading that is um, far afield, I think, for for most psychologists and maybe even most psychoanalysts. Uh, yeah. you, can, you know, you do have this interesting background coming, coming out of Greece and, and in the Middle East. And mm-hmm. uh, do you consider yourself an outlier in terms of psychoanalysis and psychology? Um, I, I, don't, I don't mean that in a negative way. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't think it in a negative way. I, I, yeah. think, I think that, that would be accurate to say there's there's a lot in how I think and how I work that makes me a little bit unusual, perhaps even as an analyst in terms of, yes. the, of um, in terms of the kinds of thinkers that I engage with and the way that I read them. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so, <coughs> so your book is really based on on conversations and on a kind of, um, I would call it uh, your own sort of qualitative research project, if you will, that involves uh, reading, reading widely, uh, reading uh, psychoanalytic sources that aren't necessarily considered to be in the mainstream, um, and and interviewing uh, people from uh, other uh, sexual orientations and and so on. People who are, who have been traumatized, people who are victims. Uh, <coughs> uh, how would you describe the sort of psychoanalysis that you're interested in? Mm. Um, I I would say that the book the book does have an interview with um, actually a very interesting person that maybe we'll get to talk about a little bit more later. Uh, But mostly the book has is leaning on clinical vignettes uh, that I share in very limited ways for my practice, um, offering them not as a way of analyzing the individuals about whom I speak, but as a way of using that material always with the patient's permission to to raise some issues for us to think about that I think we don't think about very much in psychoanalysis and and also very much in psychology. And I also become very, very preoccupied with a play 
that um, dominates um, kind of like a couple of chapters in the book. So there's many different methods, all of them, as you said, qualitative um, in this book. Um, and I, I work with a psychoanalyst that maybe is not widely known, at least not yet, even though he's, he's picking up speed in the last few years, by the name of Jean Laplanche, who is a French psychoanalyst who has a very unusual way of thinking about the unconscious and about psychic life. And mm -hmm. I, I take these unusual um, ideas that he has, which are extremely exciting and which can take us to very interesting and new places. And I really play with them in the book. I put them in conversation with queer of color critique and with sexuality studies and kink studies. And I'm very engaged with performance studies. Um, so the book is really a very interesting um, and I think strange um, kind of like outlier kind of a volume um, yeah. because it sits in the middle of a very unusual Venn diagram, psychoanalysis, performance studies, some philosophy and queer of color critique. Yeah. Yeah. And I had a question and it just, it just uh, escaped me. Um, we'll find, Oh, I wanted to ask you, who do you have in mind as your readers for this book? <laughs> uh, what a good question. Um, anybody who is kind of like interested in ideas and who's adventurous in their thinking and who's willing to stretch their thinking or to stretch it or to have it stretched by a text. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. That that's why I signed up. I mean, <laughs> when, I, when, I, when I saw I saw uh, <coughs> the description of your book and so on, and I realized, whoa, this is really going to stretch me. I'm I, this is uh, touching on a lot of stuff that I'm mm -hmm. not very familiar with, but uh, mm -hmm. probably should could learn and grow from the exposure to it. So that's the attitude that I uh, come to this discussion with. So this is as we attitude. Yeah. I would say, David, this is a terrific attitude because in some ways the book, it, it, Sexuality Beyond Consent is, is a very accessible text to whomever is willing to put the work into it. Like you can come knowing very, no, no Laplanche, no performance studies theory, no um, kink studies. You can have come as a novice to this text and it will give you everything that you need to be able to follow some of its arguments. And very quickly you will find yourself in, in conversations that are, unfolding in the general culture so it's it's a very reader friendly book for the dedicated reader yeah yeah well let's dip into some of the the populations that you're talking about um one is queer and transgender people and uh, how does that come about why that particular uh, mm -hmm. two subgroups yeah, I, I would say that the book is more focused on thinking about queerness than it is about transness, um, which is an area that I work on as well, but is not as prominent in this book. Um, and what I what I do in the book around queerness is to put some pressure on thinking about it as an identity category, uh -huh. um, as kind of like describing people who are kind of like gay or who are um uh, bisexual, and I move it away from thinking about that as a as a more bound um, experience of sexuality to think about forms of sexuality that are queer by virtue of how they deviate, how they deviate from the norm. Um, and I do so not in a pathologizing way, but as a way of opening up space to think about erotic experiences that that we have trouble accounting for in psychoanalysis and certainly in psychology, and to make an argument that accounting for them is beside the point that there's other possibilities um, of how to think about queer desire, queer pleasure, and queer erotics um, that, that happen on a different frequency than sexuality per se. Yeah, and so part, part of what you're saying, I think, is that there's a lot more diversity in that world than we tend to think. We tend to have some narrow categorization of, of who's queer, who might be queer, and what that might mean in terms of their sexual practices and so on. Yeah. And but I'm you're saying it's much broader than that. 
I would say it's broader and I would actually even take it a step further than that to say that it's not about like I'm not making an argument for making a, a, a larger perimeter that is more inclusive of more people, even though, of course, that's important. I'm making an argument about the, the kinds of um, queer sensibilities that exists in many of us um, that may be anxiety provoking to approach. I, mm-hmm. I, I don't mean this in the sense of, oh, like, you know, you think you're straight, but maybe you too have gay desires. I don't mean it in that sense. Um, I mean it in the sense of the particular form of queerness that I'm interested in, in this book has to do with the proximity of desire to trauma and the proximity of erotics to places that have wounded us um, and that can be very, very painful and the ways in which we're drawn to these kinds of experiences rather than experiencing thinking about sexuality as a place where we we feel safe or secure or contained. Well, let's go to trauma because uh, that's a really interesting proposition that you have in relation to trauma, if I understand what you're saying, uh, which you pr- pretty clearly come out and say that much of what passes for trauma therapy today may in fact be traumatizing rather than healing. Do I have that right? You're, you're very close. I think that it's, uh, I, I very much I'm saying, I'm not saying it this way, but it's a very reasonable conclusion from what I'm saying that much of what passes as trauma therapy is, I would say, not traumatizing, but traumatophobic. And what I mean by that, and this is one of the terms that I use okay. in the book, maybe, oh. I should, maybe I should back up and kind of like explain a couple of terms um, so okay. that our listeners can, can yeah. follow up. Uh, So in the book, I introduce the notion of traumatophilia. Traumatophilia is a composite word. It comes from the word trauma and the word philia, which is, which in Greek means an affinity for something. Like when we say that somebody is a bibliophile, like they really like books. (coughs) So in talking about traumatophilia, what I, what I begin to flesh out is the idea that even though we generally in psychology and in psychoanalysis, tend to think of trauma as something that people, experiences of trauma as something that people move away from or are afraid of or recoil from. That what we also see in the clinic and what I see in my practice and what we also see in everyday life is that there's also a way in which we are drawn to our trauma. We are drawn to sites that have wounded us, that traumatic experience can never be healed or fully repaired in the ways that a lot of psychology and psychoanalysis imagines. Um, Nobody has ever gotten cured of their trauma, the truth is. I mean, we don't talk about it this way in, in psychology or in psychoanalysis, but it's true. Nobody has ever been restored to who they were before they were traumatized. So the question then becomes, if that's not possible, what is the story that we're telling ourselves and telling our students and telling each other and telling patients and telling the world about healing? And one of the things that I propose is that that we have become very traumatophobic. We have become very afraid of trauma. And what I mean by that is not that we're afraid of being traumatized. Of course, it's very reasonable that one would be would not want to be traumatized and, and yeah. we don't want people to be traumatized. But that once we are traumatized, trauma is has a really shaping effect on the human psyche. It both distorts it, but it also shapes it. And the book asks, what if we became less preoccupied with how to heal trauma, which is an impossibility, and became more interested in what subjects do with their trauma, meaning where trauma appears? how trauma has a share in who you become, rather than thinking of that share only as a distortion or as a warping of the subject. And that is a a rather paradoxical way of thinking about trauma, which is unusual. But in the book, it takes us into some very interesting places, in exploring sexuality and ex- exploring art and aesthetic experience, um, so that, that I would I would say that as a response to kind of like when you said, 
um, kind of like that, that this is a way a manifesto against the, the healing industry that has become, has been coming out of psychology and psychoanalysis. <laughs> you, you note that we're at a particular moment, a cultural worldwide moment where we are awash in trauma, right? Mm -hmm. With, with the, the wars that are going on in various parts of the world, wars that I've, I guess have always been with us. So mm -hmm. we've always had that thing happening in our, in our surround mm -hmm. and, and, and in our mind, in our imagination, in our reality. So what are we to do with that fact? I mean, I, mean, I get the sense that you're saying that we need to accept that fact rather than fight it. Um, help me with this. <laughs> yes, no, that's that's an important distinction that you're asking me to draw. I, I am I, I am not what I'm not saying is that look, there's so much trauma, like why bother? Like it's gonna come at us anyway. We can't stop it. The forces are too big. I, I am certainly not arguing for a depoliticized psychoanalysis. I am certainly not arguing for us to, to give in to whatever social injustices or familial um, injuries come, come into the subject. I'm certainly not saying that. But what I am saying is that there are, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to speak about what happens after somebody has been traumatized. Um, once somebody is traumatized, um, the idea of extracting that trauma from the psyche is an, is an impossibility. So what can we do with somebody who has been traumatized? And when I say somebody who has been traumatized, that's everyone. Obviously, not everyone is traumatized to the same degree. Not everybody is traumatized by the same social structures. But to some degree, more or less, everybody is carrying some trauma. So what if we start becoming less panicked about resolving trauma since we can't do it anyway and become more interested in what subjects do with their trauma. And in, in making this argument, I have been very inspired and influenced by a play that I'm working with um, very closely in the book. And the play is Jeremy O'Harris's Slave Play, which has some very interesting explorations of the the tangle between racial trauma and erotic life. And part of what happens in that play, which I'm, I'm always careful when I talk about it because I don't want to spoil it for anybody who hasn't seen it, um, mm. but because it's really a play worth experiencing as opposed to hearing about. But what I will say very generally is that part of what happens in that play is that Jeremy O'Harris is working with um, with trying to explore how might the Black partners in the interracial couples that are depicted in the play, how might they manage the traumatic experience of being racialized and having been subjected to all kinds of racial violences and intergenerational inheritances around their Blackness? And what what the play shows is that the rubric of understanding or recognition or bestowing rights or dignity will only take you so far that other things, other forces have to also be in play. Um, and would, 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 you, would you repeat the name of the play and where people might find it? Yeah, I mean, um, the play is called Slave Play. And it is slave written, play, slave play, mm -hmm, a pretty provocative okay. title. Um, it is not what one thinks, and it is also exactly what one thinks. Um, and right now, it's playing in Ohio. The, there's a new production that's in Ohio, mm -hmm. so anybody from our any any listeners who are in Columbus, Ohio, can go see it until um, mid. I think it's it's playing through the 19th of February. But any production that anybody is able to watch, I think, is really worth trying for. Um, 
Is it, I take it it's not streaming online somewhere? No, it isn't. And, and I would say it's the kind of thing that I hope never streams online because there's something mm-hmm. about the experience of being in the theater with the intensities of what happens in the play. I'll say very briefly that the first act starts with the three interracial couples that are depicted in the play engaging in really surprisingly surprising and confusing sexual scenes of racial humiliation with their white partners. Um, And what happens seems almost like it is a reproduction of the kinds of um, violences that one might see in a plantation. So it's it's a little bit kind of like, it, it really throws you off to be in 2020, three right now and watching something like this unfold on a stage uh one would think that we are quote unquote over that like why would that be depicted what what is happening here yeah Um, it leaves one feeling quite uncomfortable um but what 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 it also does is it it revivifies in the theatrical space something which is not in the past but also very much in the present Mm -hmm. and it makes the audience feel its participation and its complicity with not just the violences um, against um, Black people, but also the pleasures of those violences, which is something that we, especially those of us who are white, have much more trouble talking about and thinking about. Um, And that there might be erotics to racism that... Mm are very much not in our conversations about when we talk about anti-Black violence. Yeah. You know, I want to go back just a little bit when you were saying, so what do we do with the fact that we all have experienced trauma in one way or another? And it seems to me that that one of the main outlets is has always been to share it, to tell stories, mm-hmm. whether those stories get written or whether they get turned into plays, or whether, or whether they get shared in support groups or in friendship groups. Mm-hmm. It seems to me that's very much a part of who we are, is working with it in, a, in an imaginal way. Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I think it's both right and what the book does is try to find the limits of that. Because... Yeah. You know, I was also trained as a psychologist, just like you were. And part of what I was taught, which many of us were taught, was that being able to put things in words and symbolize them and being able to narrate them and have them be witnessed or understood or recognized by others is how trauma gets worked through. Yeah. But Of course, we could go to music and we could go to art which are nonverbal, non-narrative forms. Exactly. So the question, so if we're going to go to music or art, then the question would be, so what, what, is, what is happening with music or, or, or art? Like, it's hard to say that music heals you. I mean, you could say that there's something healing about it, but it's hard to say that it heals you. Something else happens in our engagement with art, which is not the same thing as what happens with words. Many times what art does is not settle us, but unsettle us or upset yeah. us. Certainly slave play is a very upsetting play. It's it's a very, I would say, with Chorus Fast to say that it's a very sadistic play. And and I say that in the way that I use the word sadism in, in the in the book, which is that I, I make a very, very careful argument that sadism can be ethical. It can be ethical in the sense of keeping one's feet to the fire and having one deal with something that is very difficult that one would rather turn away from. And in that Mm -hmm. sense, slave play kind of forces you, if you're going to stay in the theatrical space, you're going to have to, you can't consume the play in the way that one consumes um, a TV series or like when we binge on a show, like this is not for consumption. Like, that's part of why I hope that it never makes it into a, a streamable version and that it's always in the theater. Because right. in the theater, it stuns you and it shocks you and it shocks you into, into your own excitements. Um, and it shocks you into your own uh, 
you know, the word complicitly is now overused. Um, and therefore, it's easy to think that we know what we mean about it. But it shocks you into your own participation. And there's something really sadistic about being forced to see that and also really necessary. Um, you know, that puts me in mind of another vehicle, which is teaching. When you mm -hmm. talk about holding somebody's feet to the fire because mm -hmm. they need it, <laughs> uh -huh. uh, I think that happens has happened not always but happens potentially happens in teaching and of course now there's a big cultural rebellion mm -hmm. against teachers who teach that way because mm -hmm. uh, uh the student as consumer mm -hmm. you know and you have to keep the consumers happy and yeah. if the mm -hmm. consumer so this is something that we've wrestled with in the academy and are still wrestling with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the neoliberalization of the university and of teaching is, is a huge problem, right? Like the neoliberal attitude of the student is a consumer, they're paying for a product, are they are they receiving the product that they thought they were buying? And I think I think this brings up very interesting questions about consent, which is also a major preoccupation in the book. Like, what do you think you're signing up for? And what you're what are you actually going to get? Yeah. And you know, consent discourse tells us that at stake here is transparency or honesty or the respect of boundaries, meaning like are you being are you going to be given what you were promised? And are you going to be respected to not have something done to you that you didn't want? But as we know, I mean it's an excellent example that you're bringing, as we know from the experience of teaching or training, especially when you train clinicians or supervise clinical work, uh, what we know is that oftentimes you think you're going to get one thing, but you end up getting something very different. And yeah. how you manage that gap between your expectation and what you're actually offered, it, that it does not belong to the domain of affirmative consent. In fact, in the book, I, I call this limit consent and I introduce a new way of thinking about consent that is not about is about getting things that one signed up for but one didn't expect so you sign up to take a class and you may hear things in that classroom that may be very difficult um, may, i mean how how many how many women have not come to realize that experiences of violation have actually been rape rather than an unfortunate sexual encounter because of what they're studying in the university right so you thought you were going in to hear something that is grounding or that helps you understand the world, and instead it can unsettle you. This is not, of course, to minimize the fact that, you know, there's also ways in which universities and, and professors can hold on to power and don't want to kind of like get, kind of like come, come into a place where they also understand things that we are, that you could get away with in the 1950s, but are no longer acceptable today. So, you know, that can also become an alibi for not being in touch with the social realities of race, of gender, and of class. Um, but if, if we leave this aside, and if we're not talking about kind of like using that as a, as a way of getting out of these problems, I think that it's absolutely true that in the academy, just like in the clinic, and I would say in art, and definitely in erotic encounters, part of what we sign up for is the the frustrating of our expectations. Um, and that frustrating of expectation has something sadistic in it. And I, I say that not to say that it's harmful, but to say that it, it takes a certain kind of sturdiness and integrity on the part of a teacher or on a part of a therapist to offer something that is not what the other person wants or thinks they need or, or needs or thinks they need and to offer something that might actually take them to an elsewhere that they have not imagined. Yeah, there's a story that you tell in the book that I think you're itching to tell here that would be appropriate now, and that's the what you call the slap, that story. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that appropriate now? <laughs> sure, sure. I think, it's, I think it's quite interesting. It's a very interesting story because it's so counterintuitive. It's how the story, the, the, how the book starts. The book starts with this vignette uh, of an experience recounted to me by a patient. And this patient who um, 
has of course consented to my using this story, tells me at some point in her treatment that you know she's having a sexual encounter with a lover and they have really negotiated and talked about what will happen between them. And they have agreed that her lover will slap her in a very particular way. They know what the boundaries are. Um, and the lover slaps her. And my patient feels that this slap was, compared to what she expected, it was a really exquisite slap. And she says to me, I did not expect like such a perfect slap. I expected something much more mediocre, but something much more mundane or banal but it landed on me with the right force in the right part of my face. And she says to me, I couldn't stand it. So I, I safe worded. They, she used the word that they had agreed upon to end the sexual scene. And she stops the scene, not because something bad happened, but because what happened was so good that she couldn't bear it. Huh. So I, I start out the book this way because usually – we are accustomed to hearing somebody stops a sexual encounter because somebody something was going badly or something was was negative or uh, was becoming um, uh, damaging. And here we have a situation where what what makes this individual stop the sexual encounter is that it feels too good. So we begin to see that consent is not just about what we are allowing others to do to us, but also to what we are allowing ourselves to experience. How far do we go with ourselves? And that makes consent also an internal affair. Yeah, the, the whole concept of consent seems very, very fraught. And, um, <laughs> and, and this is one way <laughs> of highlighting that. It seems to me that so much of the sexual encounter, at least as I experienced it in the past, is nonverbal. And mm -hmm. rather than today when you're supposed to have a conversation, mm -hmm. say these are going to be the limits, rather than in the moment, nonverbally, mutually feeling it out, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I I have a lot of, I mean, it's, as you said, it's such a complicated situation. I have a lot of um, kind of like, um, I have a lot of understanding for why the conversation has gotten, in my opinion, derailed in the way that it has. Mm -hmm. My sense of it is, in viol consent violations happen, like, you know, people get abused, the vulnerable subjects are more likely to get uh, trespassed. So I understand the need to find some way to talk about um, sexual assault, to talk about uh, harassment. But I also think that what this obsession with affirmative consent has created is it has really impoverished our conversations about sexual relations mm -hmm. and what they can what they can enable and what they can make happen. Um, so, you know, like consent was, affirmative consent was promised to us as a way of like giving us a way to to figure out how to do sex well and how to do it safely and how to do it um, pleasurably. And it has utterly failed. Uh, it has failed in a variety of different ways. It has not kept us safe, but it has also really narrowed the range of our experience um, because to go back to what you were saying earlier about how trauma gets dealt with being talked about, because precisely like you were saying, like the what can get, there's only so much that you can talk about. There's also a whole other range of experience that is not in language and that gets forestalled and foreclosed if all we do are, is, are interested in exploring things that we basically already know about ourselves. This is one of the problems with talking. Like talking can only take you to the places of what you already know. This is where psychoanalysis steps in and becomes interested in slips or dreams or things that cannot be said in language, but just slip mm -hmm. through language. Um, yeah, talk a little bit about the unconscious mm -hmm. and uh, the erotic unconscious. Mm -hmm. I think that's, th that's at the heart of the book. And it's at the heart yeah. of the book in a way that is... Kind of like when I was saying earlier that the psychoanalysis that I work with is is also um, 
kind of like an outlier, this is what I mean. When, when Freud first came up with his theory of the unconscious, he came up with his theory trying to understand um, uh, hysteria and trying to understand why these women were showing up in his practice that had no organic um had no organic uh, underlying organic cause for their problems and yet they had right. those symptoms and he proposed that this women must have been sexually abused and that what something else is being spoken through the symptom and that that is how the unconscious gets constituted so the unconscious is where the trauma that cannot be spoken lives and then as many of our listeners may know he took it back and he retracted from that and he came up with a different story about why these women were sick, which had to do with the notion of fantasy. But what's relevant for our conversation here is that he then started imagining that the unconscious is something that can be spoken and that if you can find a way to put it in words, the unconscious can be made conscious. And when it's made conscious, that's part of what dispels the ghosts in our closets and the ghosts of the past. But what Jean Laplanche, the psychoanalyst that I work with, adds to this conversation is to say something really interesting, which is to say that the unconscious never gets exhausted through language, that there's always going to be a residue that, that remains. And that similarly, trauma can never fully get put into words. There's always going to be a residue that remains. So we can, as we were saying earlier, talk to our therapist or talk to our friends or talk to a support group about our experience of the trauma, but what are you going to do with that residue? For, for Jean Laplanche, that residue is always erotic. It's, which is a very paradoxical, strange, but also intuitively, intuitive claim to make, because it helps explain why trauma and the erotic tend to be so close, even as we don't like that. Um, mm. Why it is that, you know, there's, I mean, we can cer certainly, slave play works very much with racial trauma in that regard, asking after the erotics of racism. But we can also think of many other examples where somebody's traumatic experience becomes very contiguous to the sexual. And historically, psychoanalysis has treated that by saying, well, but that's a problem. That's like a, a, a false pairing. Laplanche says this is not a false pairing. This is how the unconscious works. It comes into being by a part of it can be made conscious and a part of it cannot, and that part is erotic. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Well, <laughs> I think we, we've, we've gone into the deep water here, mm -hmm. and maybe it's uh, time to kind of wrap up our discussion what are the concluding remarks that you would like to leave our audience with? Mm -hmm. we, uh, one thing that I would say that we haven't touched on and I would make like to make a quick reference to is that all, all of the ideas that we were talking about revolve around a central core in the book. And that central core is the question of experience and how how we might think of not guarding the self as trauma discourse does, like how do you make sure that you're not traumatized again? Um, and how to risk oneself in the encounter with another person, in the encounter with art, how to throw oneself into experience, because it is only at the margins of what we can understand about ourselves that new experiences can happen. So, you know, if you're guarding yourself, you can have safety, you can have some degree of security, but but transformational experiences don't happen by guarding ourselves. They happen when experiences that touch us at the core of our being, that really sees, our, sees us from deep inside, happen at the border of what we understand about ourselves. Mm -hmm. In many ways, this book is about transformational experience. Yeah, that's a, that is a uh, great uh, close there. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm glad, glad you uh, reminded me of that and took us there. So uh, I really want to thank you. Uh, uh, I'm going to try to say your name again here. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Algi. Help Secretary me. <laughs> Secretary Bullio. <laughs> Secretary Bullio. Yes. Uh, 
Thank, thank you for, thank for you being my for, guest today. And thank you for like diving into these deep waters with me.